We have the pleasure of welcoming Bob Berg today to our interview series. I'm Ashwara Jain from the People Home team. Before we begin, just a quick intro of People Home. People Home is an end-to-end, one-view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work with AI and automation technologies. We run the People Home blog and video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Bob is a well-known, renowned author and international keynote speaker who concentrates on sales, marketing and influence. He's the proud author of the book, The Go-Giver, and his books have had a sale of over 2 million. He was named among the 30 most influential leaders by the American Management Association and also among the top authors in the world by Richtopia. He has a simple belief, the amount of money you make is directly proportional to how many people they serve. We are happy to have someone of his stature to be on our interview series. Welcome, Bob. We're thrilled to have you. Oh, thank you, Ash. Great to have you. Congratulations on that wonderful award that your company won. And uh, I just want to say hello to all my wonderful friends in the beautiful country of India. Well, it's a pleasure to have you, Bob. And uh, Bob, let me begin with asking you, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about your book, you know, the Go Giver series that you have so well crafted and you've put in so much effort into it. What is it about? Sure. And it's a series of, of parables. So they're short stories. Actually, three of them are parables. One is not. One is more of an application guide to the first book, The Go Giver. Um, but the rest of them are parables, and they were co-authored with a wonderful, wonderful writer by the name of John David Mann, who's a, a brilliant storyteller. I'm much more of a how-to person. I'm step one, step two, step three. I'm kind of boring. But uh, John has a way of taking things and, and weaving a wonderful story out of it. And the book is, the books themselves are really based on a premise, if you will. And, and that premise is that shifting your Focus, and this is really the key, Ash, shifting your focus from getting to giving. And when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others. Understanding that doing so is not only the uh, not only a nice way, of, a more fulfilling way of conducting business or leading an organization, it's actually the most profitable way as well. And whether you're a, a salesperson focusing on uh, creating value for your potential customer or client, whether you're a leader who is um, focusing on those on your team, helping them to become leaders, helping them to become more effective, helping them to accomplish their goals through your leadership, when we can move that focus on to others, moving from what we call an I focus or me focus to what we call an other focus, that's really when people respond to us. It's when people want to, to buy into our ideas. It's when they feel good about themselves and uh, they're much more likely to, to be very productive and very happy. And it's a very exactly. beautiful concept, uh, you know, that you've built out there. Uh, and tell me, Bob, you know, what does it really take to go from getting to giving? Are there some baby steps that we can start with? How does it go? Yeah, well, I think it begins with, with understanding that, that doing so is actually going to be more advantageous for yourself as well. And, and let me explain what I mean. If someone's doing business or acting in a certain way, and you said to this person, so how is this working for you? Uh, and they say, oh, great. I can't imagine it being better. Well, then they're probably not going to be open to the idea of making a change. However, if they, whether as a salesperson, they're, they're working very hard, but they're not creating the kind of business that they think they should be, people are not buying from them, or as a leader, you feel you're operating out of compliance as opposed to bringing on commitment. You know, you feel like people are fighting you. They're doing only what you tell them to do, if, if that, and nothing more, okay? And so you feel, you know, as, an, as a leader, I'm really not as effective as I could be. And maybe you are effective and a good leader, but you feel there's more that you could be, 
okay? Then you're in a position to even ask the question, okay, how do I do it? How do I go from where I am now as a leader or a salesperson or a, you know, a, a, a parent or a friend or whatever to this next level? And that's what we'd say, okay, you're going to do so by, by focusing more on the value you can bring to others. And, and so in understanding that, let me put this in, into the context of sales, if I may. When I speak to sales organizations or when I speak at sales conferences, I'll often say, I'll ask the question, how many of you would agree with the following statement? Nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet. Right. And we all laugh. Right. Because we know they're not going to buy from us because we have a quota to meet. You know, how many people do you really do? Uh, do you agree that they're not going to buy from you because you need the money? Right. Or even because you're a really nice person. No, they're going to buy from you only because they believe they'll be better off by doing so than by not doing so. The good news about that is it means that that salesperson who can shift their focus from getting to giving, what's giving, giving time, attention, counsel, education, empathy, right? That's the person who's gonna earn the trust of that client. It's the same in leadership. It's understanding that nobody's gonna follow you because you want them to. Okay, they're going to follow you because they believe their life will be better as a result of doing so. Now you might say, well, but compliance should be enough for that. I'm paying them money and they should be, well, that's fine. And you'll get, you know, through compliance, you can get the minimum amount of, of action from that person, but you're not going to get their best because it's understanding that people, first of all, want to feel valued by others. They want to feel valued by their leaders. They also want to feel as though they're part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, and as Dan Pink talked about in, in, in his great uh, book, Drive, namely, they want a sense of autonomy. They want to feel they have control over their destiny. And so when you as a leader come to understand this, now it's a matter of understanding why you should want to move from getting to giving. Then, you know, it's a matter of learning how to do it. Now, you know, in, in The Go-Giver, we talk about uh, actively looking for ways you can bring value to others, looking for ways you can make their lives better. Uh, we look at how, you know, by the, the, num the, the, the amount of lives you touch, that's how profitable you're going to be or how big an organization you're going to grow or, or what have you. We talk about the law of influence, which is about putting the other person's interests first. That doesn't mean you're a, a doormat. It doesn't mean you're a martyr or self-sacrificial. It's simply the understanding, as we say, that all things being equal, people will do business with and allow themselves to be led or influenced by those people they know, like, and trust. And there's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you and others than by genuinely and authentically moving from that eye focus to that other focus. Uh, we do this authentically. We make sure that we're, we are um, acting according to our values and that we're acting as ourselves, we're showing up as ourselves. Now, this doesn't mean, and I think this is very important for leaders, when we say, you know, be authentic, that doesn't mean you use authenticity as an excuse to not grow. For example, the leader who says, well, I yell at people a lot, you know, I have anger issues, and if I was to change, that wouldn't be authentic. Well, that's, no, that's totally, wrong. Uh, <laughs> what it would mean is that that leader has an authentic problem that that leader needs to work on in order to become a higher, more effective, authentic version of themselves. So we never want to use authenticity as an excuse for staying where we are. We want to use it as a motivation to step into our highest nature. And then law number five, the law of receptivity, really talks about the fact that not only do we need to give but we need to be willing to receive. It means that when we're, when we're helping people with a product or service that they're finding extraordinary value from, we deserve to, to receive financial compensation for that. 
money. It means that that leader, when they're leading in the correct way and they're earning that loyalty, they're earning their trust, they're earning that commitment, it means they have the right to enjoy and gratefully receive the fact that they've got a lot of people out there now who are rooting for them and who want to be part of their mission. Wow, that is, that's wonderful. That gives so much insight. And there are a number of things that you spoke about uh, that were very interesting, you know, the law of receptivity and how you should kind of pay it forward. Uh, you know, do not, you know, limit yourself or just limit your knowledge to yourself, but have um, a mission to kind of give purpose to other people. So that's where yeah. you, know, you have to talk about others, not just yourself. And you know, you bring up a great point because, and, and I remember that in the classic book uh, written in 19, I think 37 by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, what I felt was the underlying message of his book was where, excuse me, where he wrote, ultimately people do things for their reasons, not our reasons. And it reminds me that a great leader, a great influencer, what we would call, I guess, a go-giver leader, always ask themselves questions to make sure they're focused correctly. So they ask themselves, how does what I'm asking, and let's say in this case, they're a, a leading an organization. They have people who are, who are they're leading, people who they're maybe looking to develop as leaders, what have you. So this leader is gonna ask themselves, how does what I'm asking this other person to do, how does it align with their goals? How does it align with their wants, their needs, their desires? How does what I want this other person to do, how does it align with their values? What problems am I helping them to solve? How am I making their life better and more meaningful? And Ash, when we ask ourselves these questions thoughtfully, intelligently, um, genuinely, authentically, uh, not as a way to manipulate another person, right, into doing our will, but as a way of building everyone in the process. Now we've come a lot closer to earning that person's commitment as opposed to trying to depend on, you know, that, that compliance that so many leaders depend on. Absolutely. And, and uh, that really makes me think, you know, what is, what is our limit of uh, being vulnerable? How much of ourselves as leaders can we really expose to employees in terms of being transparent or in terms of authenticity? Uh, you know, I would say this. It, it kind of, it, it's sort of when you're talking about character. And character, the word character, comes from an old Greek word, meaning to scrape or scratch. Uh, it came to mean an engraved marking and eventually a defining quality. Um, you know, we could say the sum total of all one's qualities uh, is their defining quality or character, right? And it's interesting about leaders that we've all had who had high character, they always seemed to stand for something and we always knew where they stood. Now, that didn't mean we always agreed with them. That's not the point, but we always knew where they stood. And it also didn't mean they didn't make mistakes. Sure they did. It didn't mean they didn't apologize. People with high character, great leaders, they apologize when they make mistakes. It also didn't mean they didn't course correct. They absolutely did. And it also doesn't mean that they're not flexible on strategy. Sure, flexible on strategy. However, when it comes to those values-based decisions, they are immovable, immutable, and unchangeable. And that's why I think we have so much respect for them. So when it comes to how much, you know, do you show as far as, well, I mean, I think that's just, it's, <clears throat> it's just a matter of staying congruent with your authentic nature. Now, here, here's an interesting thing, though. And people say, well, and, and I, I think sometimes we look at authenticity and we think it's the same thing as transparency. I think the two words are related. I don't think they're exactly the same, and, and here's why. Let's say, and again, we'll put this in the sales vernacular. You have a client you're calling on, 
And this is a client, Ash, who they're a nice person, but they're not a really personable person, right? They're not really a relationship person as much. They kind of, you know, they want to kind of get down to business after a quick hello. They get down to, well, we have to respect, obviously, the people's ways of doing business that, that you know. And so let's say you have a, a really bad back, okay? And you couldn't even sleep last night. You're back, and I hope that never happens to you, but I'm just saying, we're just using an example. Uh, a bad back. And and you go into the person's office, uh, the person says, hi, Ash, how are you? And now, if you were being totally transparent, you'd say, oh, my back is just hurting me. I could hardly sleep last night. I'm in so, but he doesn't want to hear that because that's not him. Okay. And so you'd say, oh, fine. How are you? No, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that's, you don't have to be transparent in that. It's not appropriate to be transparent. Now, if it was the kind of client where that is the relationship, well, you would be, and that would be authentic there. Now, when you go to the chiropractor later on and he or she says, how are you feeling? Now it's totally appropriate to say, oh, my back is hurting me. I couldn't sleep, right? So, so I always think we need to, you know, to be the judge of the appropriateness of a situation whenever we can, of course, be trans transparent, always authentic, always honest. But we, but that's not the same as having to bring someone into every nook and cranny of our lives when when it's not serving a purpose. That makes a lot of sense. And um, you know, in terms of uh, sales professionals, right now, you know, the business is down and a lot of sales professionals are anxious, their hands are itchy. What do you think they should be doing right now just to calm themselves down? Can they focus on something that would enrich them, make them better? Well, you know, I think there are a few things here. One is, you know, successful people, they deal in truths. They don't try to say, oh, this is inconvenient, so I'm not going to pay attention to it, okay? The, the, they, they first look at what is. And we have a very difficult situation going on right now. There's no question about that and no amount of motivation or wishful thinking. No, we deal in truths. Okay, then we look at, at what some of the ramifications are, certain things we cannot do, what the choices we don't have, and we, we look at them honestly. Now, though, we don't stay stuck on that. We don't focus on the, the problems. We, we acknowledge them, okay? We understand them. Um, but we now focus on what we can do. And there are lots of things we can do. We can work on ourselves. We can read books that we feel will be helpful or watch videos on YouTube. There are tons and tons of videos that would be helpful. We, we can... We can connect with our prospects, customers, and clients, and just let them know we're thinking of them. Uh, there are, there's, there's a woman from a, uh, who's an account executive with one of the major telephone companies here. And one day she was calling a client just to check in on them to make sure they were okay. And it was around lunchtime. And she said, oh, I'd really like to take a break. But, you know, she had a little daughter and she said, and I have to keep her entertained. And she said, you know what? And she, she, happened to, she happens to look somewhat like Elsa from the um, Frozen, the, the, the movie. And so she, she put on a little uh, uh, Elsa princess kind of costume type of thing, he said. And she started reading stories to the little daughter children's stories to the little daughter to give the mother a break. Well, the mother started telling other people about it. And she said, would you do that again? And so she contacted all her clients and let them know that if they have children, she'd be glad to read. And so she's been really dressing up now in full Elsa costume, reading children's books to the kids at lunchtime. It's just a way, now again, doing that just because it's something she wanted to do to bring value, but wow. Did she, I, I would guarantee you, she has some loyal clientele uh, at, at this point. And, and, and you know, it, one person said to me the other day, in fact, this person's a neighbor of mine. He's not a, not a, a client or customer. He, he said, you know, I, he, I asked him how things are going and he said, well, it's frustrating. He said, because I, I certainly can't call my customers because they don't want to hear from a salesman right now because they've got their own problems. And it is a business in which 
they don't, right now, he would not, his materials would not be helpful. Right now, they're trying to figure out what they're, you know, what have you. And I said, well, you know, uh, an associate of mine, a colleague, Dan Burris, who is, has for 30 years been one of the leading business forecasters in terms of trends for 30 years, is great. He's holding a series of webinars to help uh, custom, uh, company of executives determine what to do in this. I said, why don't you contact all your customers, your prospects, your clients, and send them the link to Dan's webinar. And that way you're going to really help them. Dan will get some new listeners and readers and you'll be a star because you'll have called them with the idea of bringing value to them. Right. And of course, others, you know, we are in a position where we can still, you know, do business. So I think it's a matter of what's appropriate, what's within your choices that you feel are appropriate. Now, another thing, though, is to, aside from all the books you can read and the learning you can do, is I know with me, I'm rereading some books right now uh, that have been very inspiring to me by a guy by the name of Michael Singer. Uh, who wrote The Untethered Soul and The Surrender Experience. And um, I'm fine, and, and I, I love those books because they help us to really deal with what we cannot control and to be able to not have that rule. And, and I need that same reminder as everyone else. We all do, I think, most of us do. And so I, I think that's what we wanna do. We wanna live in the solution, you know, focus on the solution. Um, ask ourselves, you know, keep learning, Ask how can we add value to others in whatever way it's appropriate, and also keep ourselves in the right frame of mind by reading those books or re-listening to those audios that we have found to be helpful. Absolutely, that, that would be so much better to just try and be productive at this point in time. Um, and you know, Bob, uh, right now money is just uh it's so tight for all businesses right there are some businesses that are making money out of this but most of them are not and um you know very aptly you put it that money after all is just an echo of value right um so i it would be wonderful if you could expand on that idea and how does it apply to businesses right now Sure. Well, when we say money is an echo of value, what it really means is to the degree that you focus on bringing immense value to others. Now, remember, value, uh, uh, price is a dollar figure, right? Um, it's just a set figure. Value is the relative worth or desirability of something to the end user. People will exchange their money for that which they feel is of greater value than the money they're exchanging it for, okay? Um, and so uh, we say money is an echo of value because to the degree that you're able to provide value to another human being, a customer, they're going to exchange money for that. So the money is simply an echo of value. The key though is to focus on the value, not focus on the money. You, because if you're focused on the money, they're going to sense that. And again, they're not buying for your reasons, they're buying for their reasons. So when you can discover, and this is really what selling is, it's discovering what the other person needs, wants, and desires, and simply helping them to get it, then the echo of that value, the result of the value you've provided, will be money. Now, money is tough right now. Uh, there's, there's no one magical answer, okay? Um, once things start to get back to whether you want to call it normal or the new normal or whatever it happens to be, it's still going to be the same, you know, basic, uh, you know, market-based system in which you're finding people to bring value to in exchange for that, that money. But yeah, right now money is very, very difficult. Uh, you know, it's a tough situation and there's nothing, uh, there, there's no magic solution. Yes. And I will say this. That the, to the degree that we continue working now, though, that will pay off afterwards. So, and that's why I think it is so important to keep in touch in the, to the degree it's appropriate to with our prospects, customers, and clients. Uh, and if your product or service is not something that's appropriate right now for them, we can still in some way try to find value to stay on top of mind. And, you know, the, again, the work you do now has the best chance of paying off later after this thing is over. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense.
and now now while we're very uh, you know we're trying really hard to be people centric we're trying to be uh, you know empathize with employees but we have to take care of the business also so there's a constant you know riffraff between being business centric and people centric that a lot of leaders are going through so, um, you know, do you have some advice for them? How do they work remotely with teams? Because they're suddenly forced into this. How do we cope with that? Sure. Well, remember, being people-centric is very profitable. So it shouldn't be a matter of, you know, in, in regular life, when we're not involved with, with something going on right now, in regular life, it's not as though it's a trade-off between being people-centric and profit centric. It should always be people centric because to the degree that you're people centric, that's the degree the profit is going to be much higher. Okay. Um, that's been proven so many times. And again, for the reasons, it always goes back to logic and ration. Uh, if you want to inspire people, care about them, <laughs> right? Um, create the context where they want to do well, create the context where they yeah. Now, obviously, right now, though, it, it's it's different only because we're in a different situation that, that there's businesses trying to stay in business, never mind anything else. Now, answering the question, it should still be people centric, but we also have to decide if a, if a company is going to have to make tough decisions, whether it's laying off some people, whether temporarily or or uh, or um, uh, as some companies are doing having everyone take a little less and doing it that way. I mean, the people will make decisions based on what they feel is, is going to be best for all involved. Um, as far as, you know, leading virtual meetings, I think now more than ever, it's very important for that leader to, to express their empathy and express their concern and really show up as a human being. For, for a couple of reasons. First, if you go into panic mode, they're gonna go into panic mode. That's why you're called the leader, not the follower, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, so the first one is to, again, you acknowledge the situation. Uh, again, a good leader doesn't just, it's not what we call unicorns and rainbows and making believe nothing. No, you acknowledge the issue, of course. Um, but you also have to be the strong one. You have to hold that vision, even though right now that vision might be difficult to hold. But that's why you're a leader. Uh, and then as you go around, you know, uh, on, on the call and you're talking to the different people, make sure you ask, and I, I heard this from someone else and I, I wasn't told who it was. I wish I could credit them because it's always right to credit people with ideas, but I, I don't know who the person is. But this one CEO who, when they went around on the phone, they first asked everybody about their families and how they're holding up and and what's going on with you and so forth. And what it did is it, it, it helped people to see Yes, you know, we're talking business, but this leader is not just ignoring us as human beings, right? You know, and, and that's very important. And so, and then, you know, you do the business that you need to do while you're, while you're on those, those calls. Uh, I think for right now, obviously, we're going to do a lot more of this online. Uh, and that's fine. You know, we'll do that for right now. Will we continue doing this afterwards? I don't know. It depends if people find a lot of these meetings have been very helpful. I think it's important to meet in person when you can too. I've never thought of it as an either or. I've always thought of it as an and. Uh, but people might find that these meetings are, are uh, you know, save a lot of time without costing uh, relationship building or others may not, you know, so we don't know what's going to happen with, with this. So, you know, we have to play it by ear while at the same time, Again, the, and as you make the, the best point, staying human, staying people centric. Now it's going to be very interesting. The fact is, we don't know, and and you know, it seems like everyone has an opinion of what what it's going to be, and that's fine. And I always listen because I want to know what you know. So, but we don't know. We we won't know until it until it happens. Absolutely. And um, just to wrap wrap this interview up, Bob, do you have any advice or any other important sound bites that you'd like to leave our audience with? Well, I mean, I, I think it always goes back, at least when we're, when we're talking about leadership and sales, it always goes back to what a, a mentor a long time ago said to me. Uh, he, he said, uh, you know, if you want to make a lot of money in business, he said, don't have making money as your target. Your target is serving others. 
Now, when you hit the target, you'll get a reward. That reward will come in the form of money and you can do with that money whatever you choose. But never forget, the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It isn't the target itself. Your target is serving others. And I think whether we're talking about sales, leadership, relationships, friendships, uh, you know, wherever, whatever, and wherever we happen to be, I think when we can, when we can remember that to the degree we can focus on bringing immense value to others, again, as they understand it as being of value, that's the degree that we will be successful. Absolutely, I could not agree with you more. Money is a consequence. You need to focus on others. You need to focus on value, as you so rightly said. Um, you know, it was wonderful talking to you, Bob. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you sharing your views with us. It's been a learning experience for me. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ash. I appreciate you greatly.